Section 23 of The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 2, March 15, 1919. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 2. The Jeweled Ibis, Chapter 10, In the Balance. In silence they went stumbling through the appalling blackness. Without torches, or the plan of the only safe path through the maze, their only hope lay in Imam's instinct, and the calm-eyed Egyptian seemed at fault many times. Hudson's wound throbbed until he was afraid the fever in it would make him delirious, but he gritted his teeth and fought to keep a clear head. They must escape. All of life lay before them. Then there were the jewels, which were worth many thousands of pounds to any London or Amsterdam diamond merchant. They would put him financially on his feet. With them he could aspire to the girl he loved. Without them, given time and freedom, they would find the labyrinth a wonderfully interesting study. Originally it had been a cavern, not unlike the Mammoth Cave of Kentucky in size, at least. In this immense space, Sesostris had built his stone passageways, alleys that crossed and recrossed and lost themselves against blind walls. And every polished slab of marble was carved by a real artist. The gigantic complexity of the work stunned the imagination. To add to their difficulties, nature, in some strange convulsion, had ripped crevices in the ground and tumbled shattered stone into many of them. In most instances these gaps were narrow and shallow, but others were wide and appeared almost fathomless. These, however, the little party were fortunate enough to miss. Necessarily they progressed at a snail's pace, for haste might, was almost certain to, in fact, be the cause of their death. The intense darkness, the permeating odor of decay, and the knowledge that they might never leave the place brought a qualm even to the strongest nerves. Hudson felt Marion shrink against him, and he slipped an arm about her in a sudden surge of passion. "'Don't be afraid, little girl. You must not doubt for an instant that we will get you out all right. We must, because I love you, Marion. I could not speak before. I was poor, and you—' Her fingers pressed lightly on his arm. "'And I love you, Dave,' she said simply. "'Happiness comes in the strangest of places.' Danger, hopelessness, was forgotten. Only the glorious realization of hope was a living fact. They did not know how long they wandered. Chandler, who had been buried in disappointment at failing to find the real prophetess, began to understand the gravity of their position. He questioned Imam, but the Egyptian admitted that he did not know whether or not they were on the right track. Without food, water, or light, they would be the luckiest of mortals to escape with their lives. The hours dragged on and Chandler, forgetting his sense of loss, felt the menace of the darkness. It was an actual weight. He understood how men could go mad with fear when entombed in mines. But for the presence of his comrades, he too would have lost his sense of proportion. In sudden panic he reached out to feel if they were really there. Would the darkness never end? The passageway they followed narrowed, then broadened suddenly, and a flare of light struck them like a blow. Light? From what? It could not be. No, it could not be. It's daylight, gasped Chandler almost hysterically. Daylight! The others echoed his exultant shout. After hours in darkness, that single blade of sunshine made a stunning reaction on their nerves. The light came through an opening at the end of the passageway, and wonder of wonders, a series of narrow steps led up to it and freedom. Beside the stairway loomed a statue of Osiris, the shadows twisting his features into a peculiarly sardonic grin. The millionaire, dazzled by the light, would have sprung forward had not Hudson dragged him back. There was a pit at the foot of the staircase, a deep crevice some twenty feet wide and evidently of natural formation. Dave peered downward. Though the sun hurled a piercing blade of light into the pit, it lost itself in the shadows long before it plumbed the bottom. There were the steps in front of them, almost within reach yet as far away as though it were a thousand miles distant. In their terrible disappointment, each one acted as his nature dictated. Hudson took out his pipe and filled it slowly. Marion dipped her trembling arm through his, and in spite of her efforts, the tears would creep from under her lashes. Chandler ground out an oath and paced up and down, muttering. Imam sat waiting, with a rather wistful truthfulness, for Hudson to do something. The opening was perhaps halfway up the wall of the pyramid, and— from the rising brightness of the sun, it was evidently about ten o'clock in the morning. They had been wandering in the labyrinth for fifteen or sixteen hours without rest, 
and they were almost exhausted. Well, said Dave as cheerfully as he could, we might as well wait here until we're rested, and then use our brains to find a way across. What do you say, Chandler? The millionaire sighed nervously. I guess there is nothing else to do. So the wearied little party sank into heavy slumber, while the pink glow turned to yellow and then became a mere reflection as the sun rose higher. It seemed the most natural thing in the world for Marion to creep into the shelter of Dave's arms, while that almost tireless young man sat propped against the rocky wall, racking his brains for a method of escape. With the pressure of her cheeks against his shoulder, the fragrance of her hair in his nostrils, and the rapid beat of her heart against his, Hudson wondered more and more that he had been able to win her love, and he was grateful to the bones of him for Chandler's generosity in offering him half of what was found. Without those baubles he was penniless, and for him to marry the girl he loved under those conditions was nothing less than dishonorable. But he had them, and her, and he would find a way out. By and by his head drooped. Exhausted, nature always had her way, and at last Hudson slept as soundly as any of them. Sleep is an indeterminate thing, and a man from his own sensations cannot tell if he has been in the land of Nod for ten minutes or a thousand years. When Dave awoke, because his subconscious mind had recorded an unusual sound, he wondered drowsily how long he had slept. Then he eased himself cautiously to his feet. The peculiar acoustics of the narrow passageways carried sound for long distances. Hudson could hear the regular pat-pat of leather shoes and the mumbling accompaniment of voices. The priests of Zeus had followed them. They had only their bare hands to defend themselves. Dave aroused the others, and they waited with the sort of feeling a condemned man must feel when he hears the tramp of the death watch. The glare of an electric torch flashed on the little group. A laugh rang out, and then a coarse voice followed. "'Why, here they are. It takes a bloomin' Britisher to get what he wants, don't it?' "'So it's you, is it, Cullen?' asked Hudson coolly, though he could only see the shadowy figures. "'Yeah, it's Cullen. It's himself he's working for now, not them bloody priests. And over them jewels, and we'll call it a square. What do you say?' Hudson laughed. The little bar of light wandered over them again before it settled on the bulging leather bags hanging from the belts of Imam and the counterfeit prophetess. When he saw them, Cullen made a hissing little sound between his teeth. Apparently the proximity of the jewels had turned him hot with greed. He stooped and hurled himself forward in a tigerish leap, one hand gripping the girl's throat, the other tearing at her bag. Imam clutched him instantly, and they swayed there, the three bodies close locked into one. The torch played on them and their elongated shadows danced and mimicked on the carved walls. Hudson sprang forward almost as quickly as a mom, but even as he stretched out his hand toward them, the little group swung backward in the desperation of their struggle and plunged down into the abyss. Three horrified shrieks blending into one beating through the abyss with a blood-curdling intensity that set the teeth on edge. The ultimate essence of horror wailed in the voice, and it echoed up and down the corridors like the scream of a damned thing. Whoever Cullen's companions were, they possessed none of his courage. His sudden disappearance and the shriek that came so eerily up from the depths unnerved them. They dropped everything they carried, and Hudson heard the walloping of their feet as they rushed blindly away. The suddenness of the tragedy was stunning. In spite of his color and strange ways, Imam had grown in their estimation from a servant to a friend. He and his quiet little wife had served them to the death, and the tears that came to their eyes was the moisture of genuine grief. But thought... Not retrospection was needed now, unless they too were to find the end of all things with freedom in sight. Hudson stood erect, the light tinting his hair and bringing his features into harsh relief. His muscular hairy arms were folded on his chest. Though there was turbulent emotion raging in his heart, it was not reflected in his face. Scarcely with the expectation of finding anything that would be of value to them, Dave prowled around to see what Cullen's followers had dropped. With the knives and tobacco pouches and charms, he found what he had dared not hope for. Two long pieces of light manila rope. And yet it was the most logical thing in the world for them to have. Hudson carried it back to the edge of the crevice. "'We'll get out now,' he said confidently. Chandler looked at the chasm, yawning redly up at them like an open wound, and shook his head doubtfully. "'How?' Hudson pointed at the image. Old Osiris has been grinning into the darkness for a good many centuries. Now we'll give him something to grin at. This rope is pliable enough to use as a sort of lariat. We can lasso that statue and fasten our end to this pile of stone. With the other rope, we can make a sort of chair, with a guy rope attached. 
Then I'll go over and haul you two over after me. Unfortunately, he added in a rueful voice, none of us have had any experience in roping, so that will probably be the hardest thing to do. It was. Cast after cast was made without success, but at last Perseverance won, as it always does. The moose slipped over the ugly grinning head and was drawn tight. Hudson tested it by tugging with all his strength, and then fastened it securely. Marion clung to him a trifle hysterically, but he soothed her, then gripped the rope and swung himself out over the gulf. True, it was only a matter of twenty feet, but to crawl hand over hand across a bottomless pit, even for twenty feet, is no easy matter. To the watchers, whose lives depended on the jerky, swaying advance, the distance seemed ten times what it really was. It was harder on them than on Hudson. Many times he had swung about in the shrouds of sailing ships ninety feet above the deck or the pounding sea. Suddenly a thought popped into his head. The shock of a mom's death had prevented him from thinking of it before. Down there, with the bodies of the Egyptians, were the jewels that had guaranteed his early marriage. To earn enough to give Marion a home worthy of her would take years, perhaps, yet there was no other way. Honor is hard when love is in the balance. Hudson reached the other side easily enough, and the rest was easy. Marion seated herself in the improvised sling and shut her eyes tightly while Dave dragged her over. Chandler followed. Then, with a single impulse, they started up the stairs. The darkness and heavy atmosphere of decay suffusing the place had left its mark on them. They literally hungered for the clear tropic sunshine. Hudson thrust his head through the opening and peered around. A rough series of steps led from the ground apparently to the apex of the pyramid. But scattered about on that part of the plateau directly visible from where he stood were at least three score followers of the priests of Zeus. Their escape was cut off. End of section 23